Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitemout.com and P.O. Combs Asian Art and Bitemoutlive.com over in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And today is March 29th, 2021. And today we're going to take a look at the auction results from uh, Sotheby's, uh, their Asia, Asia Week uh, uh, transactions down in New York uh, from a couple of weeks ago. We did Christie's sale last week, which they had some great results. Sotheby's had some great results, too. They had, they had some holes, though, here and there. We're going to go through them a little bit. Uh, maybe maybe the, the market was a little bit cool on a couple of lots, but overall they did quite well. And uh, I wanted to start with one of the sales that really I found interesting. I always like, I always find it interesting when museums decide to deaccession things. We saw them a few years ago, for example, when the MFA, I mean the Metropolitan Museum, not the MFA in Boston, but they've deaccessioned things too in the past. I know because I bought a bunch of them. Uh, but uh, when they, when, when the Metropolitan Museum deaccessioned a few years ago, and they, they had a surplus of uh, things in their uh, stocks that was just duplicates and whatnot, and then the, they had some uh, items that were bequeathed to them that they didn't need, and the uh, the person who donated the stuff said, "Yeah, fine, sell it. If you need the money, take the money." All right. And this time around, it was the Brooklyn Museum. And if you're not familiar with the Brooklyn Museum um, in, in New York, uh, their Asian art collection, you really should get to know. Them. Them. Uh, it is a great little museum. It's a bit. It's a bit. Uh, it's a little bit worn, run down. It's a little. Uh, of the, the little. The, the threads are a little worn there in a few places. It's an old museum. It's not a rich museum, but they have one of the best Asian art collections in the United States, and, and certainly one of the best collections in the entire world. Uh, it's just. It's just that it's a small museum. They don't get a lot of attention because they're so overshadowed by the overshadowed by the Metropolitan. But if you if you're in New York and you you want to get involved in a museum, the Brooklyn Museum is a great museum. I've been there many times. Uh, they have a fantastic collection, and uh, a, a, a lot of the stuff that's in the museum came from early donors, and um, they had some very generous benefactors who left them some great Asian art right up right up until modern time in the 60s, 70s, and particularly they got a lot of great things. And if you take a look at their website, um, I'm just this is just sort of an aside. It's a little pitch for the museum because it's a great museum. And they just don't seem to. They all seem overshadowed by the big, big museum down the street. But take a look what's on this page. This is a sampling of some of the things. One of the best Yawn Dynasty jars that you've ever seen, right here. A uh, fish jar, absolutely phenomenal. Deep cobalt blue, amazing condition, and they provide lots of pictures. Uh, top, front, back, and bottoms, and so forth. They don't enlarge much, but you can still see them quite well. And uh, the other thing that they have there, if you, in case you noticed it, was this. The, 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 remember the gong, the ritual gong that sold uh, at Christie's last week for about $8.5 million? Uh, they have a somewhat similar one. It doesn't have the uh, owl's head back on it over here, but it is a really fine one. It has a great patina, and uh, it was gifted uh, some time ago. Let me see when the, see if they mentioned the, the accession date on this. Uh, accession number came from the um, Alistair B. Martin in the uh, Granoy collection. Uh, looks like it was accessioned in the 1970s. Um, the picture was taken back and then as well. At any rate, uh, it's a great museum, and the reason they were selling off some things, they had a particularly large jade collection, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of jade, and they also have some very fine cloisonne. They have good Korean works, as you can see here, great paintings and whatnot. It goes on and on. Here's the full collection. And uh, you'll notice there are some extreme rarities. So if you get to New York City and, uh, and, and, and you want to see a great collection, uh, go to the Brooklyn Museum. 852 items, 8,852 items in the collection, but the, the quality of the stuff is just top notch, just absolutely top notch. Um, uh, and, and it's worth visiting, okay? But at any rate, they had decided to clean out a few closets and they got rid of some jades. And um, we're going to start on this page here. Uh, da, 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 da. There we go. And this was it. It was just 45 lots. Wasn't a huge number. And the 45 lots raised uh, about $5.3 million for the museum. Uh, and these were all very, very nice. And you'll notice the, the estimates were very modest. Five to seven thousand dollars brought twenty thousand. Three to five thousand brought thirty thousand. Twenty to thirty thousand brought twenty-two thousand. 
But in general, the estimates were very conservative. And out of the 45, I think only one piece didn't sell. It was this cloisonne example here. I don't know why. Maybe somebody examined it and found something they didn't like about it, or maybe the estimate was just a little, a little out of range. I don't know. But overall, everything did great. And uh, we're going to walk through some of them because they had some. They had a couple. They had one piece that brought over a million dollars. All right, that they deaccessioned. All right. One of the things I wanted to start with was this. I noticed this before the sale, and I thought, what an absolutely beautiful and unusual piece of jade with um, inlaid uh, 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 precious stones on it, uh, lotus blossoms and lotus pods, and this spectacular handle. This really spectacular handle. I want to show you this. This is just fabulous. That is a great handle. And. Uh, uh, Absolutely stupendous carving, beautiful selection of stones for inlay uh, all the way around, lovely. And then look at this spout, uh, just absolutely superb. And then this fantastic uh, little finial on top with a with a with a uh, piece of lapis stuck into it. Just a nifty little pot. And I haven't seen one like this in a long time. I've seen them before, but you don't see them very often. Absolutely beautiful. Estimated at thirty to fifty thousand. It went, I think, for a deserved ninety-four thousand. Really, really nice. And then there was this, a marriage bowl. Um, it's funny, every museum that has jade collection always seemed to have a really nice marriage bowl or, or five in it. Uh, these were very, very popular around the early 20th century among collectors. And um, the Brooklyn Museum, I believe, have several of these, and they decided to sell one of them. But the one they decided to sell was rather nice. This is a doozy. It's got dragon's head, wing dragon's uh, handles on each side here and here, beautifully polished down, and then this lovely interior carving uh, with a carp in it, uh, two carp actually opposing one another, just lovely decoration, beautifully carved, deep, sharp, crisp, nicely polished, good selection of stone, and uh, the, the profile of the bowl is particularly attractive. It's a very nice shape. It's a really, really lovely shape, and you'll notice how nicely rounded the sides are, beautifully rounded, beautifully polished, and then the rim also beautifully polished. Uh, just a, a really lovely, lovely example. And uh, this was an 18th century thing. They dated as 18th and 19th century because some of the Chai Jing period jades uh, were very, very similar to the Chin Lung ones. But um, I don't know. My, my feeling is it's more likely to be 18th century. But it was estimated at 60 to 80,000, ended up selling for 190,000. So I guess a few people thought it might have been a Chin Lung example also. Uh, just lovely. And then onto this, the little screen. This is very, very nice. This Celadon green jade little table screen. These are this is quite small. Uh, these are not big. What is this? This one is, yeah, 10, 10 inches, just 10 inches tall. Looks like a poster. It's not. It's just about this big, but very lovely with two figures in the central scene, among uh, beneath this wild, rocky, uh, uh, sort of mountainous three-dimensional area around it. Here are the two figures. Uh, uh, to uh, oh, looks like an immortal and a woman going through the woods, but the pine trees are beautifully done all the way up, nicely carved. And the way they, the way that the irregular direction in which the rocks are carved, I thought was very naturalistic looking, just very very nice, beautifully polished down again. And uh, this is a jade where you can actually come and look at it and get a real sense of the surface of what an old jade carving looks like compared to the new ones. Uh, you get the texture of that polished surface tells you a great deal about the age of a piece of jade, coupled with fa fantastic carving. The carving has to be very good, not just one cut with the edge of something to make a mark, but all finished beautifully. The three-dimensionality of the waterfall here, coming down, cascading down over the rocks into the chasm. Look at this, just beautiful. And then the waves splashing at the bottom as they uh, as they come as they as they all come back together. Just beautifully done. And this was estimated at three to five hundred thousand and went to five hundred and eighty eight thousand seven hundred dollars. A lot of strength in the market for museum D accessions. And then on to this, this fantastic looking Ruyi head scepter, spinach green, uh, root carved with the, with the uh, uh, Ruyi, uh, you know, the fungus at the top of it. Just absolutely great. Look at this, very rusticated looking uh, with chimeras and vines and all kinds of stuff going up it. Just a lovely, lovely looking piece. Really was just absolutely great. And um, an 18th century one, and uh, they have it as 19th. I think it was 18th century, and I think the I think the bidders thought so too. I think they were being a little conservative. They estimated it at six to eight thousand, ended up selling for thirty-five thousand. Uh, but a, a very if it's if it's 19th century, it's very very early 19th century. 
absolutely li lovely. And then over here to this Chinlung um, uh, uh, greenish white or greenish jade, uh, uh, they call it white, it's, it looks a little green to me, but anyway, white jade uh, brush pot with feet. Uh, a, a nice example, and it's got a few russet inclusions that they worked in just fine. Uh, very lovely example here of, of, of two figures passing through the mountains. And again, a similar style of carving that we just saw on the plaque is repeated here um, uh, with a bit more activity going up the body of the piece. Just beautifully done, the building in the center there tucked in nicely and, and so forth all the way down. And um, it was estimated at 1 to 1.5 million and it sold for 1,351,000. And uh, we've seen that before with these jades. They can do awfully well. Um, and there is a, there's a good write-up on here. This came from the Woodward Collection. And it was gifted to the museum in 1914. Uh, absolutely lovely. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's a book. Apparently, there's a thing on hard co hardstone collections, the Woodward Collection. You can go look it up if you can find it anywhere. And uh, this is one of their pieces, and they donated it to the museum. And then over here to this is a very, very lovely, fine pair of spinach green jade immortal perfumers. These were not brush, these were not brush, uh, 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 brush pots. These were perfumers. And uh, for uh, incense, they were, they were Qing, Qing Dynasty, Qinlung period. Estimated, I thought the estimate on this was awfully low, 150 to 250,000 for a pair of these. You don't see pairs of perfumers very often in this quality of jade with that quality of carving. If you look at these two figures right here, and you check the faces and the head and the hair and the, and the robes, and then the background and the very deep carving behind them, and all the shading, and then this beautifully graduated staircases, staircase going up the middle here, going from wide to narrow to give a very, very strong sense of, of perspective, of depth of field all the way around. And then the two more figures over here. This thing is, these were incredibly three dimensional incredibly three-dimensional absolutely superb all the way down top to bottom and it's a pair <laughs> at any rate uh, they brought eight hundred and six thousand five hundred dollars again not a huge surprise and uh, who did these come from Woodward also right yeah the Woodward collection um, again spectacular quality jades and then hopping over here to this very very nice uh, 18th century cloisonne uh, uh, vase with uh, uh, bats all over it and so forth. The, the decoration on these were really nice. You'll notice how the, 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 the uh, artists, when they made this and they created the cloisons, they filled them with, there are three shades of blue there, which is very, very pretty optically. You'll notice there's a light blue, a medium blue, and then a dark blue. So it all sort of grades up and gives it, again, a very three-dimensional look when you look at these and uh, look at this piece. And the bats are beautifully done. The handles are, are, are lovely all the way up. And this thing was a good size, as I recall. I think it was, what was it, 14? Was this one? One of them was 14 inches. Is it this one? 15 inches, yeah. This is a good size one. Estimated at three to $500,000 and ended up selling for 315000 uh, which I think was fine. I, I think it was a very good buy. Uh, the estimate was a little strong, but it's a very unusual type, and it was awfully pretty. Awfully pretty and big. This was another big one. This thing was 26 or 7 inches tall. Most of these incense burners, except for ones that were meant for, you know, uh, very important Buddhist halls or around the Imperial Palace, weren't, often weren't that big. They were, you know, 8 to 12, 8 to 15 inches. This was double that, yeah, 27 inches tall, over 2 feet. Beautifully done, Chin Lung period, and uh, they provided some great photographs of this. And you really, if you really want to study these, the Sotheby's does such a good job with their pictures these days. Wow. And you can really pull it in and get a good look at the, at, at the surface of the gilt bronze here, uh, the, 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 way the, the way the brows are done, the depth of the, of the, uh, of the work, the uh, beautiful natural wear to the surface. And you can get right up and get a very, very good look at the surface of the cloisonne, that no lovely soft turquoise uh, uh, background. And then again, um, uh, going from turquoise to a light green to a dark green. If you look at it over here, you'll see it's a nice soft turquoise and then a very soft green, and then a, and then a slightly darker green. That sort of shading up, uh, you, we just saw on the blue, uh, with the blue one from blue, light blue, medium blue, dark blue. Here you see sort of a turquoise green, which is in the green family, lighter green, dark green. 
uh, beautiful shading and the lovely pinks all through it. And what was really nifty was the finial was still there. Um, I've seen these before and they never have the original finials on them, but this one looks like the original one. Finials on these could be quite elaborate and sometimes they get knocked off or replaced and they're sim replaced with a simple ball because they did do them with simple ball tops. Ball, ball finials, but these elaborately uh, cast ones um, with these with these leaf leaf decorations and, and so forth are uh, very desirable, and it gives the piece a, a nice sense of uh, height, uh, extends the height up. If you can imagine it without that finial on there, it would look a little truncated. At any rate, this sold for uh, over uh, eighty ninety thousand dollars over its high estimate. It ended up selling for two hundred thirty nine thousand with a high estimate of one fifty, but beautiful, wow. All right, and that was it. And the whole sale did very well overall. As I said, everything did just fine um, right down. You can go and look at them. They have lots of good pictures to examine. And you're going to see the auction houses doing more and more and more with good photography because they have more and more people uh, because of, the, because of the, the plague and whatnot. Uh, haven't been going to as many auctions as physically as, as many would want to. The previews are smaller. You can, of course, go and examine these uh, if you're a serious contender. Uh, they're, they're happy to, to open their doors, make an appointment, have you come in and take a look around. All right, now let's hop back over to here. Important Chinese art. The Important Chinese art had some tough spots in it, I have to say. It was funny because they had such good things, but then they had some things that just didn't simply get off the ground. It looked to me like they had about 40% of the sale didn't sell. Uh, and they had some very, very lovely pieces here. You have some very good Northern Song Jin Dynasty uh, 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 blackwares with iron decoration on them, russet decorations and so forth, the Yan period. Uh, they had this. This was an absolutely fantastic thing. That is something that came out of Jim Lally's store. We'll get to it in a minute. But I just wanted to sort of scroll through to give you an idea. But you notice over here these blank spots. These are unsold areas. And they had quite a few of them, more than, more than I expected. I didn't think their estimates were crazy. But it seems to me like uh, there's, there's, there's some punk spots out there. The, the, the medium, more medium price, re reasonably priced, uh, reasonably estimated things seem to be doing pretty well. And now it's that sort of that, 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 that mid-range of uh, things in the 80 to $400,000 range. If it's not, or 300, 200, 300,000 maybe. If it's not an out of the park example, or from a, from a newly released from a new collection, uh, there seems to be a bit of resistance. I don't know why. And we're going to go through some of these because this is the sale, as you remember, that had the great, the famous uh, yard sale bowl. It was bought, I guess, in Connecticut for $35. That's the story and ended up doing very well. We'll get to it in a minute. This was one of the bronzes, though, I think, that was in the sale. But I think this was actually a bargain. And I thought the estimate was awfully low, and I think it sold for a modest price. Uh, it was an absolutely great 17, early 17th century parcel gilt, uh, lost wax cast incense burner. This thing was spectacular, and it was a good size. It was 10 inches tall. This was not a small incense burner. It was a nice big one. And uh, the work on this was amazing. Um, and uh, if, if you bother to take a good look at it, the work on this thing was absolutely, it was these lost wax uh, castings. Uh, the, the work on it was stupendous. I thought. I thought it was absolutely stupendous. Great patina. Beautiful, beautiful uh, example from top to bottom. Uh, just, I love the handles. They're, they stick way out. You notice the, the ring is just hanging off of his, of his mouth. Here's a better shot of it. Um, come on. Come on. What are you doing? There we go. Here. There it is. Love the mask on the end. Love how they, they carried the waves over onto the ring hanging out of his mouth. There's a lot of little details. Whoever did this was very thoughtful, very clever, very smart. Uh, absolutely great example. And it was only estimated twenty to $30,000. I don't get it. But at any rate, it only sold for $21,420. Um, I wouldn't have been surprised if this thing had sold for over 100000 I thought it was just so wonderful. Um, I think they oiled it, unfortunately, to help it photograph better. I'd, I'd over time sort of let the oil come off of it, but they do that sometimes. And they have this one that was estimated at ten to fifteen thousand, brought three hundred and fifteen thousand, but it was inscribed eighteenth century. They say eighteenth to nineteenth century. I think it's older than that, but um, an absolutely great bronze, um, uh, beautifully done. Again. Very heavy relief casting, uh, beautiful patina, nicely done, beautiful masks on the ends with great big rings hanging out of them, and uh, just a stupendous piece. 
And there was an inscription, I believe there's an inscription on this one, uh, da, da, Dragon Chasing the Flaming Pool, Pearl, and uh, yeah, there's a poem, there's a Tibetan inscription on this, which I'm sure nudged the price up considerably. One of the things they did that was fabulous, though, they showed a good shot of the interior, and you can see the cross doorges in the, in the center here, um, uh, in the base of the piece. This obviously came out of a t Tibetan um, m a monastery or something, or belonged to a uh, 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 a Tibetan temple, or it belonged to a very influential person. I, I can't imagine any other scenario but one of those two. And um, they just called it Qing Dynasty 18th to 19th century. And I think they, they, I don't know, I don't know what they thought when they saw this. I, I think this is absolutely great. I think it's like the previous one that didn't bring that much, but they really went after this one. And then on to this, a very unusual Kangxi vase. Uh, this sold uh, a number of years ago at Sotheby's, around 20 years ago, 18, 20 years ago. And uh, absolutely beautiful green ground on this. It's a Hu form example. The form is very popular, but the so, sort of opened up archaistic uh, 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 decoration on it I thought was great in a very, very complex stepped base. Uh, but you go up the body of this thing, you'll notice the shading in the celadon over the rue heads at the bottom here. Uh, they're shaded in, and then they have this sort of opened up archaistic mask, dowdy mask, with the eyes on each side and then the nose down the middle and so forth. And then up to the top of these two cute little um, mask uh, finials. And again, you have these, these very three-dimensional stepped Rui head lappets running around the neck. I think this was a great piece of porcelain. It was not marked. But what they did do with this is they did show a great shot of the bottom. A great shot of the bottom. And this is what the bottoms of one of these should look like. You can see just very faintly the turning circles on the bottom. And you have these slight, slight grooves from the trimming tools. But you'll notice the foot has a step. And then the foot, and then it steps down again on the outside. But beautifully finished, very, very neatly trimmed. Um, and this is, a, last week I mentioned whenever you see these, the gray wear in circles, you'd be very alarmed. This is what it should look like. It looks very natural. This looks natural. Um, uh, it's a little bit thicker and wider. You can see textures in the porcelain. Uh, this is what it should look like. When we were talking about, this was about, when I was talking about the foot rim on that fake from a few, uh, from that sale down in Texas. Uh, that sold for 360000 But anyway, this was a great-looking pot, estimated ten to 15000 which I thought was crazy reasonable. It was around 10, it was 10 inches tall, 10 inches tall, and ended up selling for $21,420. But I think that was an absolutely great buy, good thing to buy. And furniture also remained very, very strong. Uh, here we have a very nice pair of continuous uh, uh, yoke back uh, chairs, very attractive, Hon Wa Lee, uh, the late Ming period, and uh, they were estimated at 60 to 80,000. They ended up selling for $352,000. Uh, uh, good furniture from old collections seems to still have a lot of uh, bump behind, a lot of push. And uh, you notice they have these very attractive uh, brass uh, mounts uh, up here or bronze up on the uh, edges to hold the hold the pieces and strengthen them as reinforcements. They're quite attractive though. And uh, let's see, uh, let's see who are these. These were sold by not a surprise. These were sold by Grace Wu Bruce Limited in, in uh, London. And we've seen her things before come up in auction. Um, a, a lot of people only bought from her when they bought Chinese furniture. She had that great two-part book that we reviewed uh, a, a few years ago that she did on her own collection. It was a, well, if you're going to buy any book, you're going to own a good book on Chinese furniture. The the two-part Great uh, Grace Wu Bruce book is one of the ones you want to own. It's very good good detailed images a lot of information and it's not a huge pair of books they're nice and portable all right and then over here this was the uh, one of the one of the stars of the week because of the interesting story behind it it isn't the most expensive thing that sold um, during Asia week by a long stretch but the story behind it is absolutely fascinating that somebody picked it up for $35 had no idea what it was and then bang <laughs> here we go Estimated three to five hundred, ended up selling for seven hundred and twenty-one thousand dollars. There are not a lot of these around, and many of these were made as tribute pieces to be sent to the Middle East uh, during the early Ming Dynasty. This is a Yung Lo example. It was not marked. These uh, these typically were not marked, um, but uh, very very lovely, and they provided lots of good pictures of it. If you're interested in Ming porcelain, uh, get yourself over to the Sotheby site and save these images because they're beautifully done and. Um, you could build up a, a great index or library of legitimate pieces. And here you can really, really see the photograph they took here was to show you the, the incredible heaped and pile effect, these very dark areas, 
uh, pushing into the glaze and so forth, and, and showed you how well they could draw. And you notice that that when they the, you see this little bit of feathering along the edges of the brush strokes, this was normal. This was because the the, the, the cobalt and the brush were a little bit wet, and it just sort of bled out just very gently and created that little fringe effect in places where they used uh, the most cobalt. Wherever the cobalt was the thickest, you tend to see that little sort of like fringe come down like right in, through here. Uh, but that was completely normal, and uh, it's it, it, that also appears on some modern pieces. You want to be careful, but that's what it did look like. And there's a good shot of the foot rim on here that you want to study as well. Anyway, it's 721,000. And then over here to this. I mentioned last week that monochrome seemed to be doing awfully well, and uh, here's a continuation of that, a very nice pair of mark and period sort of egg yolk yellow jars uh, with their lids, which is quite unusual. Usually the lids are long gone on these on this form in particular, so they just break. And uh, they were estimated at 20 to 30,000. They ended up doubling the high estimate. And uh, it, I think it's just because they were so beautiful, it's just such lovely, very strong examples. And they were a pair. And here's a nice shot of the bottom. Um, here's a good shot of the foot rims that they should look like. Slight bluish tinge to the ground underneath. The mark was very strong, done with a very, very dense opaque cobalt. You don't see any bleeding or, or thinning of the, of the cobalt here. Nicely done. And um, as I said, they sold for $63,000, well above their high estimate. And these were 10 inches tall for the, uh, each, roughly. All right. There'd be a slight, maybe a few millimeter variation. And one of them had a repair, by the way. I meant, meant to mention that right here. It looked like an old repair of firing line and a crack in the body on top of it. And uh, they did awfully well. But they were so pretty. And then on to this, this very nice Kung Shi period, copper red glaze Lung Yao vase. Uh, a nice one, about 15, 14, 15 inches tall. But what was interesting about this was how the foot splays out. It had a very, very wide foot. It had a very, very wide foot on it. Um, they always splayed out a bit, but this one seemed particularly wide to me. And uh, one of the things that's interesting, I think this is the thing that had the busted, yeah, the chip out of the glaze right here at the bottom. All right, and I, I was kind of wondering how it would do with that, because that's a pretty big chip. But the thing that's interesting is you can see how thick the glaze is. Uh, you can see where the glaze is. Here's the end of the paste right here, and that's the glaze, that thick area. It gives you an idea how thick the glazes would run on these things. But it was beautifully potted, beautifully glazed, and you notice how the glaze thins as it moves up the piece and then disappears and becomes white because the glaze would flow down the body uh, after it had been dipped, and so it would be thicker at the bottom, obviously, than at the top, gravity. And I uh, ended up selling for twenty thousand uh, three times. I think that that was pro the, they had a five to seven thousand dollar estimate. I think it was because it had that that blemish out of the foot. Because there the were there have been several in this size on the market over the years, and they always seem to bring eighteen to twenty five thousand, sort of the standard range for them now. Because uh, this wasn't enormous, fourteen inches. The ones that are bigger than this can bring a lot more. They can go they can go up uh, towards six figures. But these small, a little bit smaller ones, if you take off three or four inches, they don't bring quite as much. But it's attractive. And then onto this, I just wanted to show this. this was such a pretty uh, 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 early uh, 19th century bowl, or, or maybe maybe Jiaqin uh, to Daguan period. Uh, but beautifully done, beautiful enamels, and it gives you a real good chance to study uh, glazes and enamels and and how they should look. Um, this is not a marked bowl. They, I think I think they listed it as Daoguan, uh, but it could be Chaqing too. At any rate, but very lovely, nice looking bats, beautiful shading of the enamels, uh, all the way up, very precise gilt line running around the body. And the gilding looked to be in quite good shape, all the way up to the handle. And then you have this nice round, um, uh, round very white handle top. Um, here. Often you'll see these, sometimes you see this, this form this, the, with the lid, and they sell the lids standing up as they, they try to sell them as dishes. They're not. They're lids to bowls that they've lost. The bowls are long gone, and they try to sell them as, 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 as footed bowls. Uh, so you want to be a little careful of that. At any rate, it was estimated at six to $8,000, and everybody just thought it was so darn pretty and ended up selling for 35280 Yeah, they did list it as Doc Juan period. I'm not so sure. I think it might have been a little older than that, but it was, it was a heck of a nice thing. It doesn't matter. You're sort of, sort of uh, splitting hairs, I guess. And then on to this. This was one of the big beasts of the sale. It was this absolutely amazing Shang Dynasty Gui. Uh, it was estimated fairly modestly, six to eight hundred thousand um, dollars. Had an amazing patina on it, 
and the provenance on it was it had been in the, the Sheng Yu collection, and, the, and then it came through the Hauswell Dell collection, and then to the uh, the Gottfried Hertel collection. It had been it been through a series of collections uh, over the years, um, so it had you know lots of private collector history to it. It has an inscribed bottom here, and the patina on this thing was breathtaking. Um, we, we've had discussions. We had a discussion on the forum a few weeks ago about patinas. Okay, this is a patina. Um, absolutely, absolutely great. Uh, beautiful. You notice how thick it is. It's, it's growing out of the bronze. Not it doesn't look like it's laying on top of the bronze. It looks like it's growing out of the bronze. And uh, what was the? Uh, um, let's see here. What was the width? 11, 11 and one eighth, okay? And it has these very, very nice uh, quite long uh, bands, these bands that run around here at the top and then they're repeated at the bottom. And then there's a very simple um, uh, a, a mask rebus on the side. And then these big handles, very powerful uh, uh, Shang Dynasty handles with the, with, the, with the drop off the end, this, pen, this aspect that hangs down. But just a great surface, great patina, and it had a it had the the, the uh, inscription on the inside had to do with a, a military adventure and and so forth that was added to it as a gift. So it's you know it's very rare for that. It's a documentary bronze. Most of them, a lot of them, are not documentary the way this one is, and um, uh, date it they date it to eight ten seventy two B C. Not in the era. They're using a precise date because of the inscription on the piece which makes it very desirable to know when it came and not just within the three or 400 year, you know, year range. And it brought $5,434,500. All right, and then on to this, the little, little Tang Dynasty, five, or Five Dynasty uh, a butterfly lid box. This had, had been come down um, the, the food chain of the market through Jim Lally's gallery. But what a delicate, sweet little piece. Very unusual with a butterfly top. Um, absolutely beautifully done, and these russet, the russet marks here and here going around it, and this very, very nice crackle glaze. Here's a, here's a good shot of the side of the piece right here. You can see where the glaze crept up, didn't fully cover it all the way around. And there's another shot of the top. Here's another shot of the sides. They provided some very good photographs, and here's the bottom of it, and that's what it should look like. All right, concave with the, with the fairly precise ridge running around it, very neatly trimmed. Um, and it was estimated at five to seven thousand dollars U.S., which just sounded okay. I guess everybody fell in love with it, though. And uh, I think it was for the butterfly. It has, to, it has to be the butterfly, right? It has to be that wonderful butterfly top. And uh, ended up selling for twelve thousand six hundred, jumping right over its estimate. But a charming piece. I can see how somebody would get emotional about it. And say, I want that. I want that. I want that box. Especially if you have somebody in your life who's a fan of butterflies. And then on to this. This was sort of one of the disappointments of the week, and I have no idea. I don't think there's anything wrong with this. This is a particularly great uh, Joseon Dynasty 18th century classic moon jar. Um, um, it just absolutely has everything going on it. It's stood nice and straight. A lot of these don't stand very straight. A lot of these have you know, a little, they tip a little bit. Um, this one is beautifully done. The glaze on it looked good. Um, I couldn't find anything wrong with it. I haven't heard anything from anybody saying what was wrong with it. It just didn't sell. Four to six hundred thousand dollars. I don't think the estimate was crazy. Um, I have no explanation in the world why this didn't get off the ground. Maybe one of you have heard something. Uh, it has uh, uh, the only history is private collection acquired in Japan in the 1950s, which there's a, a number of these in Chinese uh, J uh, Korean collections. It was 13 inches tall. It's about in the right range of the size. These can be a little bigger, up over 15, 16 inches sometimes. But uh, there's one of these in the Brooklyn Museum. There's one of these in the Met. there's one of these in many museums. A lot of museums have these. They were particularly popular, uh, uh, at, popularly added to collections in the in the first quarter, third of the 20th century. And this was a, a very nice one. I and I'm just at a complete loss as to why it didn't sell. Maybe there's a, a little currency issue getting that much money out of Korea right now or something. I don't know. But four to six hundred thousand dollars seems perfectly reasonable for that. And uh, maybe somebody will circle back and, and uh, uh, make a deal with the Sotheby's to buy this post sale of some kind because it's a good, it looks to me to be a very good example. And they provided some nice photographs over there. And you notice, just notice how straight this thing is. Uh, a lot of these tip severely or, or, or noticeably anyway, so it's a bit of a distraction. This one is absolutely wonderfully potted. And they did do a huge write up on this, by the way. Um, uh, they had a lot of confidence in it. And for some reason, it just didn't go. I don't know why. 
All right, and that's it for the Sotheby sale. Um, if you if you enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, what you think. Uh, it's it's it was an interesting sale, and if I can, I'm gonna we're gonna try and get one more in um, on this series. Uh, talk a little bit about what we're on at Doyle's and Freeman's, uh, because they, they they have things that don't always jump into the stratospheres. But um, uh, the, the, the folks at Doyle's do an awfully good job. They've done, always have. They've done, I've sold things through them years ago. Very happy, very nice people. Mrs. Doyle's very nice. I knew, I knew Mr. Doyle at one point. I met him a number of times uh, before he sadly passed at too young an age. But he was a nice man. He used to come up to Essex. And um, uh, we'll talk about uh, the Freeman sales as well. If, we, if, we, if I have the time, it's just a matter of time right now. We're, really stretched out on things around here. But have a wonderful week. We'll be back Friday with the regular video. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, uh, have, a, have a very good week. Bye-bye.